Welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Margaret Kowalski. I'm the interim coordinator of the CRS partnership here at Villanova. We're glad you're here for this important event. This is an event of the Villanova partnership with Catholic Relief Services. Catholic Relief Services, or CRS, is the official overseas relief and development agency of the U.S. Catholic community. It was founded more than 60 years ago, collaborating with the Catholic Church, partner agencies, and communities CRS works to alleviate human suffering, promote sustainable development, further justice, and support peace building initiatives in nearly 100 countries. It does this work on the basis of need, not creed, race, or nationality. The Villanova partnership with CRS was founded in 2005. It is supported by and housed within the Office of Mission and Ministry. The partnership seeks to build global solidarity through education, research, advocacy, and service. The format of today's event is as follows. Mark Schnellbacher, Regional Director for CRS in Europe and the Middle East, will speak, <coughs> followed by comments by Professors Catherine Warwick and Magan Keita. We'll then open the floor for questions. And I hope to have a lot of student participation in particular. I want to point out to you one special guest here, Vivian Manet. Vivian is on sabbatical here from CRS. She is most recently the manager of operations for CRS in the Middle East. She's focusing here on the situation of Iraqi refugees. And I want to point out that our CRS ambassadors have information for you on the Iraqi refugee crisis as a point of advocacy for CRS. You can also sign up for their action alerts on both Iraqi refugees and also on foreign assistance, as well as receive some fair trade chocolate, so visit them in the back uh, before you leave. I'd like to thank them for all of their work. There are about 50 student ambassadors on campus uh, who are learning about issues and doing advocacy within the context of their coursework here at Villanova. Finally, uh, I want to thank you again for coming, and I turn the microphone over to Father Kale Ellis, who's the Vice President for Academic Affairs, and he will introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much, Margaret. Uh, as, as you may know, there are several names for the uh, series of protests and demonstrations that began in Tunisia in December of 2010 and which spread throughout North Africa and the Middle East and actually which continue today. The Arab Spring is one, and I don't want to change the, uh, the name of the conference here, but uh, <clears throat> we had... Uh, uh, Rami Khoury here from uh, Daily Star in, in, uh, in Lebanon and uh, a few weeks ago, and he preferred the name the Arab, Second Arab Awakening. And uh, I thought that was an appropriate uh, title because uh, <clears throat> the First Arab Awakening, you know, being the, uh, the phenomenon of the Arab national movement uh, described by George Antonius uh, in his book by that title, that began in Syria in the mid-19th century against Ottoman dominance and culminated in the, uh, well, culminating, I should say, in the Arab Revolt of 1916 uh, and uh, the post-World War One era. You know, in the Middle East, <clears throat> this dream of uh, true independence was a long time and perhaps not even yet realized. So <clears throat> instead of independence at that time, uh, as people were subjected to the mandate system, which was another name for the colonialism of the Western powers. And um, <clears throat> then there was uh, nominal independence and then national humiliation and regional instability, which resulted from the Arab-Israeli conflict and the loss of Palestine. Revolutions that resulted in the establishment of military regimes, hereditary presidencies, dictatorships, and finally neocolonialism, which is described as economic and political policies by which a great power or powers indirectly maintain or extend their influence over other areas and peoples. And so what is clear is that the Second Arab Awakening was led primarily by educated but unemployed young people, that it is against dictatorships, absolute monarchies, hereditary presidencies, human rights violations, government corruption and lack of transparency, economic decline, extreme poverty, the concentration of wealth in the hands of autocrats, and on, on, and on. The list is indefinite. 
But this afternoon, to help us walk through these issues, we have Mr. Mark Schellenbacher, who is the Regional Director for Catholic Relief Services in Europe and the Middle East, and two members of our distinguished faculty, uh, the, uh, Dr. Catherine Warwick and Dr. Magan Keda. I'd like to begin by saying a little bit about uh, Mark Schellenbacher. He has been the Regional Director for Catholic Relief Services in, in Europe and the Middle East since 2003. In his 15 years with CRS, Mark has served in Thailand, Pakistan, Cambodia, Macedonia, Kosovo, and Serbia, and has also held several positions at CRS's headquarters in Baltimore. He is a graduate of Georgetown University and holds graduate degrees in theology and in public administration from Harvard University. He is a native of Saratoga Springs, New York, and he currently lives in Beirut, where the CRS Europe Middle East office is located. And next to uh, um, Mr. Schellenbacher is Professor Catherine Warwick, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Villanova, where she is also a member for the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies and the Gender and Women Studies Program. Her primary research areas are comparative law and gender and Middle East politics, and she is the author of Law in the Service of Legitimacy, Gender and Politics in Jordan. This book came out in 2009. And Professor Warwick is currently researching the uses of Islamic law in the United Kingdom and Canada, a project supported by funding from the National Science Foundation's Law and Social Science Program. And finally, we have Dr. Professor Magan Keda of the History Department and Director of the Institute for Global Inter Interdisciplinary Studies here at Villanova. He is the former director of the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies. He has published widely in his area of expertise, Islam in West Africa, and his writings include Race and the Writing of History, Conceptualizing and Reconceptualizing Africa, and A Political Economy of Healthcare in Senegal. So we're very fortunate to have all of you. Thank you for coming, and uh, I'll turn the mic over to Mark Schellenbacher. Thank you, Father Ellis, and thank you all for, for coming and uh, joining us today. Um, what I thought I'd do is just make a few comments about what CRS as an American Catholic organization, what we're seeing and what we're wondering about and what we're reacting to in, in today's Middle East. Let me situate CRS in, this, in this, that environment. Um, we've been in operating in the Middle East since 1956, since the Suez War. Uh, this year, uh, we're also celebrating, or I guess is not the right word, but observing 50 years of work in the occupied Palestinian territory. So we've been, we've been operating in the Middle East for, for quite a long time. Um, we're now 15 international staff spread throughout the Middle East and about 160 people uh, from, from those countries also work for us. As for myself, I've lived in Beirut for seven years. And just to give you an idea of where I've been lately, I, in the last two months, since the end of August, I've been to the West Bank in Gaza, to Amman, to Baghdad, and to Cairo twice. So this Arab Spring is keeping a lot of us uh, running around trying to avoid vertigo and, and try to figure out what's, what's happening and what, what we should be doing. It would be untruthful to say that we expected anything to happen last December. Um, before the Tunisia demonstrations began, I don't think we also expected them to spread quite as deeply and, and rapidly and extensively as they had. Like most everybody else, uh, like most people in those countries, like the regimes in those countries, like their security services, like their militaries, like our intelligence services, like our military, our diplomats, uh, everybody seems to have been taken off guard. And yet, in retrospect, looking back on it, a lot of people are asking, well, what did it take so long for? And people were long suffering under authoritarian regimes or hereditary monarchies. And people, looking back, you kind of wonder, well, boy, they put up with an awful lot for an awful long time. So it's great that things are, are beginning to change. And yet, we are still asking questions like a lot of other people is, well, where did it come from? Why did it come now? And most importantly, I suppose, going forward, is where's it going to go? 
Um, and on this latter question, I have to admit that we are still quite disoriented about where it might be going and what it might mean for the kind of programming uh, that we do uh, going on into the future. And yet we don't have, just like people who are still in the streets in Syria or people who voted in the election in Tunisia the other day or will be voting in Cairo shortly, we don't really have the luxury of waiting to see how things pan out uh, till we can decide how we're, how we're going to respond. Um, for us, we're disoriented in terms of um, what kind of programming we need to do because we're facing a, about six different situations all at the same time that are pulling us in all different directions. An important thing to, for us is that the operating constraints that typically affected both Egyptian or Syrian or Iraqi uh, local organizations, civic organizations, as well as organizations like my own, they've completely changed. Over the years in the Middle East, because of the nature of these national security states, we first directly and then we learned sort of habitually not to get involved in certain things. Certain topics we wouldn't get involved in, certain sorts of activities we wouldn't get, get involved in. First it was sort of enforced, but then after, you know, you do that for 30 or 40 years, you learn not to, not to bother. It's not worth the trouble, it's not worth the risk it would bring to our national staff or our local organization. So those constraints, not everywhere, but in many places they're starting to be lip, lifted or pushed uh, the, the walls of them are being pushed. So we have to ourselves get into a different operating mindset about what might be possible. We never touched human rights. It was just too much, too much trouble. As an American Catholic organization in the Arab world, which is predominantly Islamic, it was just not worth the trouble. And so now we need to begin to look at those things, and that's only one example. Um, I, I think the, the biggest thing that we and many other people need to uh, get into our heads and, and have it profoundly affect our programming is what we're seeing in the Middle East is um, people are no longer subjects, they're citizens. They're, they're no longer, well, they're probably still subjects of the Saudi king in, in Saudi Arabia, but in all these other places where they were subjects of family dynasties or other authoritarian regimes, they're not. And yet, I think it's fairly safe to say, and not a, not a horrible criticism, to say that many people in these countries are, are now trying to figure out what it means to be a citizen. The debate is on, uh, and the redefinition of on is, what does it mean to be a citizen in a polity that is still evolving? We don't know what it's going to look like in, in Egypt, for example. Uh, so people are renegotiating with, with each other, and, and probably with themselves as well, the social contract, which, which includes what are the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. And we then, we need to, as they assert themselves more actively in, the, in, the, in public life, in the public forum, in civic life, we need to adjust how we interact with them as a foreign organization. To me, the biggest question, still open, and it may be open for, for a good time yet, is how will long repressed Islamist parties and movements become incorporated into the emerging politics? This is the big question for everybody. And we saw some in, in Tunisia the other day, a moderate Islamist party was, was brought, to, uh, brought to power, at least won the majority in the parliament. Uh, what's it gonna look like in other places? What's it gonna look like in Egypt? Um, I was in Egypt during the day, I was in Egypt the day Mubarak quit. Uh, and went back about six weeks later and was surprised to hear, the first time I had ever heard in eight years of, eight years of traveling to Egypt, our national staff and our Cairo office were all chatting about, alarmedly, about the Salafists. Nobody knew where they came from. They came up like mushrooms after a spring rain. And yet, these are now obviously a, a, a group and a movement that, that was able to bring in May 100,000 people onto the street. So these, these sorts of movements need to be, people in these countries need to, need to understand themselves and, and where, where do they see these places and who are they going to vote for. I think another related question, if things do not go well, is what place, if any, will minorities have in the new Middle East? Um, what has happened in Iraq with the Christian community is nothing short of catastrophic. 
uh, it's been reduced by two thirds in 10 years. I was in Baghdad with two American bishops at the beginning of this month. There's, there's no sign that that hemorrhaging is gonna stop. And in meeting hundreds, if not more, of Iraqi refugees in Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan over the last five years or so, I have not met a single Iraqi Christian refugee family who wants to go back to Iraq, not a single one. They, they're not looking back because of the um, horrible things that have happened to them personally. And that's, that's really kind of weird in a refugee population. Normally in a refugee population, you meet people and they say, you know, I want my, I, kids gotta have a school, I need my job back, I need my house back, but we wanna go home. You don't hear that very often among, among Iraqis and especially among Iraqi Christians. So where, and, and what's happening in Syria today, uh, where somewhat, Surprisingly or annoyingly, I'm not sure what word I want to use, but the entire leadership of, of the Christian churches is publicly speaking in support of, full support of the Assad regime. And I think the only sense that I and many other people can make of that uh, unexpected position is they look, they look east to Iraq and they see what happened to the Christian communities there. They've been hosting hundreds of thousands of Iraqi refugees for eight years. So they, they're in their neighborhoods, people who have had that kind of sectarian violence perpetrated against them. They see it every day and it's essentially, we don't like it, but a deal has been cut with the Baathist, the secular Baathist party years ago. It's being held up. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna peer into the dark and see what may happen to us, but it still does raise the question. You probably heard two weeks ago or so there was a, essentially a massacre uh, in downtown Cairo uh, against the cops who were protesting a, a church destruction. Um, big questions there as to where their where their place will be. It'll be, it'll be a little bit bit different in Egypt because there's eight million cops. It's they're not going to flee quite as quickly, I don't think, as the Iraqi Christians did, but it's still a, still a major, major concern. Um, having said that, I have to say, it's these days, it's, I'm, it's much easier to be a Catholic organization in the Middle East than it is to be an American organization. If I have to choose one of the identities to sell at a meeting or something, I always start with the Catholic one. Uh, and that's not only just because of the American thing is not exactly in favor these days, given our government policies, but also it seems to me that many, many Muslims can understand why you would do this kind of work from a religious perspective. And I've had similar conversations with friends of mine who work for Save the Children or Care, and they don't have the same reaction. People have a more difficult time figuring out why would you not do this for religious reasons. Uh, so it, 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 we're still we're still okay in, in that regard, and you know if if need be, I can claim I'm Canadian or something. But the the Catholic thing is actually still, despite the rise of this Islamist movement, it, it's still it's still a good thing for us to have. Um, the last set of problems we're dealing with are very practical, and we're doing a lot of what I would call operational juggling. We have to, with everything that's happening, with, that it's about to happen with the U.S., the final U.S. troop withdrawal from Iraq, we have to adapt our ongoing programs. For example, we have very large programs in Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon for Iraqi refugees. What's going to happen when, uh, when, the, when the troops are pulled out? Will people start to go back? Will the 700,000, given what's happening in Syria, will the 700,000 Iraqi refugees that fled vi sectarian violence from Iraq to Syria, will they be on the move again? Will they be going to Jordan or, or whatnot? How much longer are they gonna wait uh, in Damascus or Aleppo about what's happening there? So we need to begin to reconfigure or recalibrate our, our ongoing programs. At the same time, we have to be looking into entirely new programs. One of the things you mentioned uh, 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 as one of the complaints of, of many of the young people who participated, participated in the demonstrations was lack of economic opportunity despite uh, a college degree. So we need to begin looking in a very different way about livelihoods, uh, sustainable, decent livelihoods. This isn't going to be achieved by having microfinance programs that work in Bangladesh or other places. This is a, a uh, we, as an organization, are going to have to come to a completely diff under, different understanding of how we work with private business, because it's only private business that can 
absorb uh, this youth bulge that you've probably read about in the Arab world where upwards of 60% of the population is below 25 years old. There's no way that, that these bloated government structures can absorb this kind of population, nor, nor, nor should they probably. So we need to figure out how we're going to work differently. As an American organization and as a Catholic organization, given the sort of the, the developments in the region, we need to f recalibrate how we're going to do what we call civic engagement program. Last five or six years, we've done a lot of work in youth leadership development, community mobilization, nonviolent communication, um, advocacy, these sorts of things, which probably in some very, very small way uh, contributed to the overall ferment in these societies. But now that it's moved to a different stage, we need to figure out what kind of, given the political subjects that are going to be discussed in the coming three or four or five years, we need to determine is there, and if so, what is the appropriate place for civic engagement, civic participation programming, um, which could be a little bit tricky. And finally, while doing all of that, we're also now in the midst of a pretty extensive contingency planning uh, uh, exercise about what are we going to do, the various what-ifs with Syria, which could, given its sectarian makeup, the repressiveness of the regime, the relative closed nature of, of that society over the last several decades, many of us uh, think that if the top blows off of Syria, it could actually make, it could be worse than the sectarian violence in Iraq that we saw in 2000, 2006. So it could, be, it could be really, really ugly. And so we're trying to do some contingency planning on that. At the same time, we're dealing with the usual overlay of geopolitical issues that one faces in the Middle East, uh, one of which is uh, the so-called uh, Sunni, Shiite, Persian, Arab rivalry uh, that, that uh, has taken on a whole new turn with the, with the uh, Arab revolutions. And then, of course, the Israel, the never-ending, never-going-away Israel-Palestine conflict, which uh, its most recent um, chapter, uh, as you, I'm sure, all read a couple of weeks ago, President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority put forward a uh, application to have uh, the state of Palestine recognized by the United Nations. There were, there are retaliatory actions now occurring. Uh, both in Israel, where since that time uh, the Israeli government has announced the approval of several thousand new houses in settlements between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And here in the United States, uh, where CRS is feeling this one, uh, several of our Congress people have put holds on already appropriated funding for the Palestinian Authority, which is uh, unless resolved very soon, within the next month or so, we'll see the dismantling of much of the aid structure that the United States has paid to develop over the last 10 years because all programs, many of the programs will be closed. So that, the whole situation of, of Israel-Palestine continues to, uh, it's either front and center when you're dealing with it or it's right there behind your shoulder and we're continuing in, in the midst of all this other stuff that's happening in the Arab world proper, we have to continue to see uh, what's, going to be, uh, what's going to be happening uh, with that, if anything. Um, I'm not holding my breath. The one last issue I'd like to mention, because we are a Catholic organization and an American one, uh, and an American one whose, uh, whose government has um, had a lot to do in the Middle East, uh, a very mixed record, I would say, but which has, in our view, in a significant way, contributed to the very precarious situation of Arab Christians. Um, whether it's what happened in Iraq or our support of, of the Israeli government and the ensuing uh, departure of Palestinians, especially since 1967, we're trying to figure out a way how can CRS, in alliance with other Catholic organizations in Europe and elsewhere in the United States and the world, we, what we can do more effectively to help secure a future for Christian communities in the Middle East. Uh, communities which are older than any of ours, uh, communities which are not Irish nuns on mission in Jerusalem, as many 
as my mother used to think, I think, um, people who speak Arabic as their first language and who are clearly in uh, a particular danger at this moment. And so we're trying, it's a very delicate subject because we, our, our fundamental guiding principle at CRS is we assist people um, for need and not creed. And yet, in this case, I believe the case can be made that it's actually their creed that is bringing them into need uh, in terms of uh, potential and, and actual persecution, if not if not starvation or economic deprivation currently, clearly them being Christians is making them more vulnerable uh, than they, they would have been, um, as the Syrian bishops seem to be telling us, whether I agree with them or not, there's clearly a need to, to address this issue. So we need to figure out how to do that without further putting them into danger by by sort of becoming their Western backers, which is one of the things that Christians in the Middle East, particularly Iraqis lately, have been, is one of the causes of their persecution, is they were lumped together with the Occupy, by the you know, more uh, unreasonable Iraqis, were, were lumped together with the occupiers, as if we're all just one, you know, the Iraqi Christians went there from Ohio in, in 1962, instead of going the other way around. So we need to be very, careful about how we deal with this issue, but I don't see both as an American organization, which from a country that respects and defends um, religious freedom and freedom of conscience, and as a Catholic organization, I don't see how we can sort of uh, get away with not, not taking this issue on, no matter how tricky it may be. So I thank you for your time, um, and hopefully we can have a bit of discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mark. I now ask Dr. Warwick uh, to comment. Uh, I was asked to say a little bit about Islam and democracy in the context of the Arab Spring. I'm going to keep calling it the Arab Spring. I like that term. Um, so this is Islam and democracy. Note that it's not Islam or democracy. Uh, I think there is a, an assumption among a lot of Western commentators that we're talking about something that is inherently a threat to democracy, to freedom, to social welfare, in any form in politics. And we need to be very cautious about making that kind of generalization. Um, Particularly, there's been a lot of concern about Islamist parties in politics, and we've seen that in Tunisia uh, in the recent elections that took place on Sunday, and for which the official results should be out right about now, actually. Um, the, the party that had the most support going into the elections was a, a Nahda party, and it's probably won the plurality of the seats in the parliament. And they describe themselves as a moderate Islamist party, and that's not always something that, that clarifies to the observer what they actually stand for. So I wanted to make uh, basically three points on this issue. Uh, one about what Islamist support means, why people might support these parties, and what that represents in politics. Another about how we ought to assess threats to freedom or to democracy. And then finally about uh, what this all means in politics in the current context. So my first point is um, Islamist support is not something that happens automatically from Muslims. They don't automatically support Islamist parties. And in fact, if you look at the levels of support, for example, in Egypt, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has about 25% support in Egyptian society, generally. Now, if people automatically, if, if being Muslim automatically made you support Islamist parties, then this would not be a political question at all. But instead, it is. These parties are, uh, they have strong support in some places, and they have to compete. Uh, with other political tendencies in their societies for the support of, of voters. So why do people, uh, lots of people actually, support Islamist parties? Um, for different reasons. Not all for the same reasons. Uh, not all for the same ideological reasons, either. Uh, for some people, it's a response to repression. These were often groups of, or organizations that were outlawed or brutally repressed under the previous regime. Uh, so they've sort of done their time in opposing the, the regimes that have just been toppled, and that gives them some credibility. Um, also, there's a, a strong anti-corruption tendency. People, voters, uh, often regard the, the moderate Islamist parties as an anti-corruption vote, because they advocate for uh, better government practices. Um, and, and there's a social welfare aspect. One of the, uh, the issues that's been raised recently in North Africa is um, whether you can have a, a sort of Sharia-based approach to lending that would reduce um, interest payments on housing loans. Well, 
in poor societies where people have ac access to housing difficulties, that's an appealing sort of, of offer to make. Um, I would also suggest that there's a sort of real political reason for support for these parties, which is that they tend to be better organized than other parties. We're talking about political systems where the regime has carefully shut down most of its opponents, but the Islamist organizations have been able to operate not just as political parties, but as social groups and cultural groups offering other kinds of services. So they have an organizational history, they have name recognition, they have leadership. So when it comes time to field candidates and to campaign, they have something of an organizational advantage, and that's one of the factors. It's not the only factor, but it's one factor that explains their strength. Um, so again, a lot of different reasons why people might find Islamist parties appealing. Um, the, uh, the second point I wanted to make is that not all the threats to, to freedom and equality come from the Islamists. Certainly plenty of them came from the old regimes, who were themselves not Islamist regimes in the cases that we're looking at. And also, there's an interesting contrast. Just in the last, uh, in the last few days, an example uh, that struck me was that you have the, um, the moderate Islamist party leading in Tunisia, and they have said explicitly that they don't plan to change um, the, the family law in Tunisia, which has long been considered the most gender egalitarian in the Arab world, and they don't intend to undo that which is an interesting thing for them to say as an Islamist party. And they've been putting that assurance out there. Of course, we'll see what they actually do, but that's the, the promise they were campaigning on. At the same time, in Libya, you had leaders who weren't themselves Islamist offering to do things like reinstate polygamy, which is not uh, something that you would necessarily associate with a secularist view of gender equality. So gender inequality and, and threats to freedom can come from a lot of different actors in society. Uh, they can certainly come from secular actors as well as religious ones. So I'm not here to advocate for any particular set of, of actors or parties, but I would suggest that um, we take an analytical approach that, that looks at the content of the, uh, the programs that these parties are putting forward. Because often in terms of equality particularly, some of the serious threats come from traditionalists, cultural traditionalists, as much as from, uh, from religious actors. Um, and the, the, the third point I wanted to make, it's just a fact of politics now that there is very high uh, levels of support for democracy across the Arab region. And that's been the case not just since January, that's been the case for years. We have lots and lots of data on this. We know this to be true. No matter how you ask the question about democracy or which aspect you focus on, you get very high levels of popular support for democratic governance and democratic uh, political competition. Now you have those attitudes out there and you have authoritarian regimes in a couple of places that have been toppled. This is a new political environment and all the political actors, the Islamist parties, the liberal parties, everybody, they're all going to have to operate in this new environment. So if they want to make headway and attract voters, this is the political reality that they face. And we see Islamist parties operating in such a way as to you know, sort of take part in the, the um, the play of political competition. They get out there and you know, throw elbows like everybody else. What we're seeing is maybe not democracy, I certainly wouldn't go that far yet, but we're seeing pluralist competition. And these are uh, one set of actors among a broad range of actors, all of them engaged in the kind of political competition that hasn't been possible in a very long time. So I think on balance, that is probably a good thing uh, for politics in the region. And it's certainly the, the, the new environment as just a matter of, of practice. Um, there were a couple of other points I wanted to make, and I'm not sure how brief we should keep this. <coughs> have another couple of minutes? Sure? Okay. Um, Mark brought up a very interesting point about religious minorities, and that is something that I think is going to be a major concern in these political systems. One thing that I would like to point out, just maybe to strike a slightly more positive note, is that despite some very serious conflicts, which I don't want to minimize, there's a long history of minority group accommodation in the region, and that's generally reflected in things like constitutional and electoral structures. That's a trend that will probably continue, and it'll probably be reflected in the writing of the new constitutions. So I don't think we should assume that there will always be a Muslim Christian line of conflict or a Shiite Sunni line of conflict. Whether or not that conflict, ex conflict exists is a question of how we do politics. So what makes it so important to do politics well? You have to construct the system well to head off the potential lines of conflict that put people at risk. But there are tools to work with in this region. There's a history of getting it right, at least in some cases. And I'm hoping that um, 
that's what we'll see as these systems develop. Uh, I guess I'll turn it over to. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Sure. I'm uh, supposed to speak on the question of uh, cautions, uh, U.S. policy. What I really want to do is um, globalize this issue, though. And I want to get you and the audience to think globally. One of the fundamental weaknesses of U.S. policy in general has been the fact that U.S. policy can be characterized as arrogance founded on ignorance. And in effect, this arrogance has been illustrated in terms of the current set of events. Take Tunisia, the beginning of the Arab Spring. The argument there was that we would never see the question of democratic electoral politics. What do we have today? Take Libya. The issue there was that a ragtag band of miscreants could never, in fact, overthrow one of the most dominant military powers in the region. What do we have today? What this uh, brings us to is the notion that U.S. foreign policy, the policy of the West, and in effect, we might argue the policy of the East with the rising China and India, may be policies that are, in fact, mounted on the faulty drivers of analysis and therefore policy formation. For those of you in the audience, you need to understand a really important point. You are right now living in a profound moment of change. It's one in which you are all involved. And this profound moment of change necessitates the real need for critical analysis on your parts that recognizes, in fact, the foibles and weaknesses of the policies that structure not simply the international, but the domestic in regards to what the United States is all about. It's an examination on your part, the need for an examination of those critical weaknesses. Of, as I mentioned before, the weaknesses of U.S. policy, the weaknesses of the policies of our allies, and the weaknesses of those people who we think are in competition with us. It's also most incumbent that you begin to think about the fact that there are other players of huge magnitude, if small number, on the world stage. Non-state actors, we like to call them. The most prominent of which are those who have just occurred in this thing that we call the Arab Spring. You need to look in the mirror, folks. They all look like you. They're your ages. They're doing similar things. Not the same thing, but similar things to you. Here, in that regard, where youth are central to the process, the issue is how our foreign policy affects our domestic policy and vice versa. The issue, in effect, is how you become analysts and then drivers of policy yourselves. The second element of this particular kind of analysis revolves around the question of how you articulate, how you understand, how you characterize this thing called the Arab Spring. As Americans, you will want to particularize this particular event. You want to see it as a thing that's going on over there that is done by them. The real need that you have is, in fact, to globalize this particular event and then to think of where your place might be in it. If the Arab Spring is seen as part of a global phenomenon, and if we use the seasonal metaphors, then I would ask you to drop back five, ten years. I'd ask you to ask yourself about a Chinese winter, and not because it is a place or a time in which things are dormant, but because it was a moment in which young people in China began to think about protesting. And they still protest in different and sundry ways, and the government in different and sundry ways is forced to respond to those protests. If 
we were to think about a Chinese winter, how about thinking about a French winter? You've disregarded that notion. Young people in France, winter and spring in the streets. Or think about a British spring and fall. Young people in Great Britain, spring and fall in the streets protesting. Or think about Occupy. You familiar with Occupy? You needn't go far to find it. I saw it last weekend on the streets of Philadelphia. If you don't like Philadelphia, go to New York. Try Washington, D.C., Chicago, Portland, San Francisco, Atlanta, Occupy. Being at home is too much for you? Montreal, Toronto, London, Rome, Spain. So what am I driving at? I'm driving at the fact that this particular thing that we call the Arab Spring is a manifestation of global proportions. Not only is it a manifestation of global proportions, but the proportions are so immediate and intimate to those of you sitting in this space that you fail to recognize it. It's young people like you. And part of the reason that you fail to recognize it is because of old geezers like me. We taught you to perceive the world in a fundamentally flawed fashion. The flawed fashion is to think of an American exceptionalism in the same way that you think of this thing as an Arab exceptionalism. You think that this thing has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. And people like me who teach you, the media that reinforces those teachings, get you to fall into the same pattern. Those people over there, they are either politically crazy or so economically destitute that this is the only thing that they could do. And those people in downtown Philadelphia or on Wall Street, they have nothing better to do. The world begs a different kind of analysis, a fundamentally more critical analysis of this situation. The ignorance is that you're not able to make these kinds of linkages. That ignorance leads to a kind of arrogance in terms of the formulation of policy that makes us think that the way in which we live and the kinds of things that we do are fundamentally superior to the ways in which they live and what they do. As Mr. Schnellbacher has indicated, one of the things that's going on there is one of the things that we need to do here. You need to start critically examining the fundamental concept of social contract. You need to start thinking about its reconfiguration. And in doing that, you also need to think about the real notion of being civically engaged. It's not just them and us. It's all of us together. So here, the fundamental question for you, if you think there is such a thing as the Arab Spring, is to think about what this moment poses for you as you sit in this room and you become, quote, educated. The question is about your relationship to becoming responsible global citizens and whether or not an analysis of the Arab Spring and all its precursors and its possible future formations allow you to do so. So that's the issue about thinking about the cautions for American foreign policy, but also the cautions of you as the potential drivers of American foreign policy, and of course, domestic formation as well. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Kader. We now have uh, about 25 or minutes or so for questions and comments uh, for our panelists. I see the, uh, the microphones have arrived. There are, uh, uh, there are microphones here. If you would have questions, if you would kindly uh, use the mic, it would help uh, other people uh, to, to hear them. Oh, we also have a walking mic also. Thank you. 
So any, anyone like to uh, begin? It's always difficult to jump start. I go, Marwan, I know you have a question. I, yeah, oh, yes, it is on. I'm, I'm just curious, um, when we talked about the minority religions and, and so forth, what's the relationship, how's Lebanon handling all this? Uh, Lebanon, as you know, is a, is a country of minority religions. Uh, what's the future of the minority religions in Lebanon, and how are they affected by the Arab Spring? Let me answer the first part, uh, the second part first. Um, Lebanon's been surprisingly quiet with everything else happening all around it. Uh, I mean, it's got a lot of its own problems that didn't need the Arab Spring to ignite them. But I, have, I, I do think it's accurate to say, especially with, with what is happening in Syria and the recalculations that Iran has to be doing with what's happening in Syria and the relationship of that to Hezbollah, uh, I, I would describe Lebanon as being sort of on a knife edge. I think people, it's a very nervous time there because of what's happening what's happening next door. And there's other elements like we're not going to pay for the special tribunal and all this other stuff that just never seem to get resolved. Um, religiously speaking, it is a, I'm not convinced that the, the myth of conviviality, which is the word that they use, is quite as strong as one, you know, the tourist board might have us believe. But it is stronger, I think. There are certain accommodations have been worked out. From, from what I can observe since the, the end of the Civil War. There are certain troubling aspects to that, however, is that, for example, uh, as you know, uh, Lebanon has not had a census, a census since 1932 when the French were still there. So people are guessing there's a pretty good idea of what the different components are, which, which different uh, religions make up what components. There's also a big issue of, of the teaching of history in Lebanon about how the Civil War basically it stops before the Civil War started. So there's not sort of those basic things where you begin to reconstruct or figure out a different way of being together haven't yet happened. So I think that's, that still does leave it quite vulnerable. Um, but I, because of the history of Lebanon, the purpose of its creation and whatnot by the French, despite the continuing decrease of uh, the proportion of Christians within the population, which still continues to be problem, especially among young people emigrating, supposedly for a short time, but they seem never, many of them seem never to come back despite their short, short work stints outside. Um, I, I, Lebanon is sort of like the canary in the mine shaft for, for Christians in the Middle East. They do look to Lebanon because of its history and because of the proportion it holds in the population. While there's 8 million cops in Egypt, they are only 10 percent of of the Egyptian population, whereas if you include the various uh, Christian um, Christian denominations in in Lebanon, it's closer to 40 percent. So people do look, whether you're in Syria, Iraq, or or Jordan, people do look to Lebanon as sort of the, as I said, the canary in the mine shaft for where things are going. And it, it seems to be holding its own. Terrible divisions among the Maronite community getting worse uh, at a time that they can least afford it, but. Uh, Generally, they're going to they're going to be buffeted by it. what every other Lebanese is going to be buffeted if if Hezbollah has to make a fundamental strategic recalculation because of what's happening into Syria. L Lebanese Christians aren't going to be hurt any worse than that than a Sunni or many of the Shia or a Druze. So it's 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 not great, but I think compared to some of the the other cases, it's a much personally and communally it, it's it's a better situation. I think. Uh, I'd just like to, um, I heard what Dr. Kata said about a Chinese winter, and uh, it made me think of 1989 when I was a student in Beijing in China and witnessed uh, the, the growth and then the brutal crackdown of the democracy movement, and it got me thinking. The impact of what the other term for this is, the Jasmine Revolution um, in China. In spring 2011, Flash mobs started appearing in places in Beijing. They gathered outside of KFC, and they all went inside and ordered a number three as a form of protest. Um, 
A man was arrested for walking down Nanjing Donglu in Shanghai for carrying a jasmine plant in his hands. Um, Ai Weiwei, the architect or the artist who designed the, the bird's nest from the 2008 Summer Olympics, a darling of the Communist Party, now arrested. Liu Xiaobo, who was the Nobel Prize winner, Peace Prize winner, also incarcerated, still in jail. Um, in fact, the word jasmine, mo li hua in Chinese, is still banned on mobile phones, email. Um, jasmine flowers are not for sale anymore. And, uh, you know, instead of organization, you know, organizing movements by internet, the opposite is true. They're very careful monitoring of the internet. There would never be a forum like this. If there was a forum like this, it would be carefully monitored, and all of you would have love letters in your faculty email box the next day congratulating you on your new appointment at Cabrini College at a non-tenured position. Um, but th this gets me thinking about what are the roots of all this and what happened? In 1989, the roots of this were really economic discontent and uh, panic buying of commodities. Everything from laundry detergent to toilet paper were being panic bought, hoarded, and then sold on the streets. Um, and really what started this whole thing rolling was the death of a party leader who advocated reform and his passing and the memorial started the ball rolling, but what really started the ball rolling was the students who saw the situation, they analyzed it, they ran with it, and they paid for it. I lost friends, I have friends who are, right now their careers came to a very short, <laughs> they were on their way up and came to a very uh, fast decline because of their involvement. Um, and I guess really what I would like to ask, the three questions I'd like to ask are, the, what took so long that you mentioned? Uh, to what extent were this, the events of spring 2011 really motivated or sparked by economic angst or discontent? Uh, the second question would be, what is the role of women um, in all of this? I mean, I know th these are states that have a fairly um, fair to abysmal gender rights uh, record, and I'm just wondering what the the role of women is in, in all of these, uh, in the outcome of these uh, movements. And lastly, what is the, what are the prospects for civil society in each of these countries? There really isn't a democratic tradition, and I'm just wondering, is there any, will, will democracy take, have traction, and will so civil society actually eventually prosper? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take the gender question. Um, <laughs> that's a good question, and there's been a lot of attention to that. There's a, a lot of commentary, a lot of speculation. Um, I think that we've, we've got just really impressive examples of women turning out and getting involved, particularly among the younger activists. There's, there's just lots of women who are involved who are, are driving a large part of this. So we see wonderful examples of women's participation. And that's not something that's you know, totally unheard of in, in politics either. Um, although, yeah, in terms of representative structures, the Arab region does worse than any other region uh, in the world in, in women's inclusion and representation. But, um, yeah, I think, I think this is something that's getting a lot of attention. But we also have, you know, just to sound a cautionary note, there are plenty of historical examples. I would suggest the Algerian Revolution and examples from elsewhere in the world where women are really important in the revolutionary struggle, right? And they play a really important role. They get a lot of recognition. And then that comes to a halt because the new regime tends to reflect um, the kinds of interests that were dominant in society already. That's always a risk in a revolutionary scenario, not just in the Arab world or in the Muslim world. And I think people are really, really conscious of that. And one of the things that the new representative structures and parties are going to have to address is demands coming from women who are very politically active to maintain this kind of inclusion. So it's an open question, but a lot of the signs are good that we will see more inclusion than, than we have in the past. And there are certainly some very, very powerful and articulate women advocates uh, on these issues. One example of that is the current, uh, in the, the the transition government in Cairo, the Minister of International Cooperation is a woman. 
and she's taken on the U.S. State Department and USAID very strongly to redetermine or redefine the terms of trade, the terms of terms of assistance, whereas the United States since 1977 was giving a lot of money, a uh, billion dollars a year for 30 years. Um, basically, the Egyptians would do what we generally told them to do, and this woman is saying, mm -mm, we're going to change that. We're going to do what we want to do with it. You don't want to give it to us? Keep it. So whether she stays on in the, in the elected regime I, or the ne next government, I don't know, but she's certainly asserting her, uh, in a big way, in sort of a very high profile way, asserting her uh, beliefs and where the country should be headed. On the first question, I, I don't know why it started when it did. I mean, we know the story, the, the young guy who was selling vegetables and fruits on the street because he couldn't find a job with his uh, college degree. The word that started then that continues to be used is dignity. That's what his uh, self emolation was about. That's what was being cried in Tahrir. And you just think about it. There were many people who were, who were running, they were either in the professions, hundreds and hundreds across the region who were running multi-billion dollar a year businesses very well and very profitably, and they weren't allowed to vote for their municipal councilor. People finally got to the point where saying, well, this just doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm making, I'm running the army, or I'm running General Electric for the Middle East, and I can't vote for my town councilor. I'm not trusted to vote for my town councilor. And that's what, I think that's what the dignity idea, you still hear it now in the protests that continue in various places, certainly in Syria, is people asserting Again, moving from subject to citizen, getting the, the dignity of citizenship, to people open, open to and wanting to accept responsibilities for things that they were basically, they, in many ways, people of the Arab world under these regimes uh, and these uh, emirates and whatnot, they were infantilized. Don't worry about these things. We'll worry about it. We'll have the deal, we'll give you their subsidized food, your subsidized gas, your subsidized electricity. And, but don't ask us about these things. Not, no need to worry about it. And this, I, th I believe what's happening now is, an, an, at least in part, an assertion of, well, no, that's not how we want to live anymore. Why it's now, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but, but I think that's a, a, a very large dynamic. As to the civil society, I think so. There's already vibrant, very vibrant, uh, organizations and whatnot in the Arab world. We might not recognize them for that. So for example, uh, with Hezbollah, with Hamas, with the Brotherhood in Jordan or, or uh, Egypt, very strong social service networks, very strong. Uh, and it's what is, as you mentioned, as part of their claim to fame and their ballot box appeal is that they've been running for years. And these are, you know, it's, it, it arises out of the, the Islamic uh, tradition of zakat, which is philanthropy or charity. And these groups are very, very well organized. They might not look like the Rotary Club here, but I think these are the groups, they, find, they, have, they have the basic glue and the basic networking and the basic uh, sentiments where I think these will be able to grow quite rapidly now that the shackles have been taken off of them. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually, quite, quite hopeful of, of where, that, where that might go. There's a long tradition to be built on, and now that they've got some light and some air, I think we'll see some interesting things happen. Let, let me uh, segue back into that point uh, <clears throat> by mentioning that the, uh, one of the Nobel Peace Prize winners is a woman from uh, Yemen. Yemen. Um, and within, within that context, it, it speaks to, to the question that you ask about um, about civil society. Mm -hmm. And so he, here again is the, the caution that I have for students. One is the necessity to begin to think globally and to think in terms of relationships, the relativity of these concepts that we toss around in terms of civil society. Civil society in one space is not necessarily civil society in another space. Um, one can look at the United States and question um, the notion of whether or not society is civil at this moment. You also need to um, take into account the notion that what we're looking at here when we ask the question of why this took so long is that this experiment in self-government 
that we seem to think that we're all involved in is in fact a process. It is not an event. Democracy does not spring full blown from any brow, any place. It has its variations. It is contingent upon context. The context has all the kinds of nuances that one could ever expect in the interaction between various kinds of human beings. And so the process is in fact what we should in fact embrace and what we need to analyze and in some ways we need to revel in. This um, question of civil society also asks um, the question of what we think of in terms of how we define something that we call democracy. It brings me back to the, to the point that I was attempting to make early on about your obligations as students at a place called Villanova if you were serious about embracing an intellectual life that thinks critically, that allows you to think critically. And that is an examination of what we mean by democracy and its imperfections. We haven't perfected it yet. It goes back to the process element. Finally, I want to go back to, um, to the point that was made about, uh, or the question was asked about whether this was about economics. And without being too glib, too simplistic, it's all about economics. Yeah, sure it is all about economics. It's about whether or not people eat. That's economics. It's about the policies that govern eating to some degree or how one dresses. It's about the ways in which people can be regarded as resources and then controlled, distributed, moved from place to place, ordered about. So in, in that sense, it is all about economics or political economy. It's about the policies that govern that. And people are asking themselves in the process of thinking about democracy, whether or not one can dismiss political democracy from economic democracy. Can you dismiss having a say in the formation of the policies that run a place from the formation of the various things that in fact make living in a place possible? So it is, in my mind, all about economics. Over there, thank you. Over there? Yeah. And then you're next. You're next. Um, the Saudi crown prince just died, so Saudi Arabia hasn't really seen the same levels of protest as other countries, but it's certainly something that the House of Saud is concerned about and is thinking about. So, how likely is it that? when they're determining the new successor, they're going to base that off of the people's wishes and the ideas behind the Arab Spring. First of all, the Saudis, because they could afford to, right when this all started, they, the king, who was actually flying back from several months in New York having back surgery, one of the first announcements he made was a $30 billion injection into new housing and jobs for young people to try to head this off. Uh, and it's so far, it seemed to have been pretty successful. Um, Saudi is a very different place than the rest of the Middle East. It's, it's, as you know, by far the most conservative politically, socially, uh, <clears throat> religiously, and culturally. Um, I don't think there's any shot whatsoever, in my view, that what's happening around them is going to decide which brother becomes the next king after after Abdullah. I, I think there's probably all sorts of um, infighting going on among the very large royal family about who's going to be next, but I, it, it seems to me in many ways Saudi, like many other things, is impervious to, effectively impervious to much of what happens around it. It was just two or three weeks ago that King Abdullah uh, made an announcement that women will now be allowed to be members of the Shura Council, which is an advisory council with no decision-making power, and quote, unquote, and they will even be allowed to vote, even. They're still not allowed, allowed to drive. They're allowed to vote, but not to drive, and these changes don't, don't, don't come into effect till 2015. So I, I'm not too worried about, you know, uh, an Arab revolution erupting among the Sunnis, 
in, in uh, Saudi, which are the, the ruling family. The Eastern Province, which is the, the wealthiest oil province in the country, is Shia. And that's a whole different story. Um, it's right, you know, it's right on the Gulf. That they could see some, some difficulty, but as they've shown in providing so-called fraternal assistance to Bahrain, the, the monarchy in Bahrain, to put down a Shiite uh, uprising, they, they've, they've got the will, they've got the resources. Um, I don't expect to see any change at all. Uh, maybe when the women can vote, things will get better, but, but not till at least 2015. I don't see it. You disagree? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> about your organization, uh, I was just curious about uh, when you're calling yourself an American Catholic organization. I mean, the Catholic part is self-explanatory, but the American I am a little confused about. Uh, what do you mean by American organization? Are you attached to any uh, political organization or any um, sort of, no? Uh, no, uh, I, we're, we're, we're owned by uh, the United States Catholic Bishops Conference, our legal owners. Um, we describe ourselves as the international humanitarian organization of the Catholic community in the United States. Um, but we're, yeah, it's no, there's no, it's just to identify ourselves as coming from the United States as the expression of solidarity uh, and global mindedness of Catholics in the United States. That's the, that's why we use both. In many places, it, it, it can be difficult, as I said earlier, the, the American thing in some places, Kosovo, I used to work, they love Americans in Kosovo. Absolutely love them because of what Clinton did, Bill Clinton. In other places, it's you. You don't really want to talk about being American. You just say American Catholic, and hopefully they don't hear the first part. I I just wondered if uh, I'm following up on uh, your comments regarding the Saudis, and I was wondering, uh, in view of the situation that is going on in Bahrain, and it might lead to other similar situations in the Gulf countries. And we know what happened there in Bahrain. It was, if it was not for the intervention of the Saudis, it could have been worse. How do you see actually the developments in the neighboring countries vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is happening in Saudi Arabia, but also in the Arab countries? In, in my simple view, simplistic view, I think probably the Arab world will be redefining what we see as democracy in the Western world. You know, I don't see democracy happening in the Arab world in the same way. And I was wondering if you can comment on it um, at the same time, because it's going to be redefined. I, I doubt very much if we will be able to apply the same principles of democracy there as we apply them elsewhere. Not only that, I think you also make a great point that it's going to look different in different places in the Middle East. It's going to look different in Tunisia than it does in Syria, where that changes, or it does in Iraq. So I think we're going to see many different, different models, different understandings. Your point, you're, you're talking about the Emirates and whatnot. What's interesting so far as is that the monarchies in the Middle East, from Morocco to Jordan to the Emirates to Saudi to the Sultanate of Oman, have all, except for Bahrain, have, have withstood so far. And Bahrain went up only because you've got a, a, a Sunni monarchy and 10% of the population sitting on top of 90% Shia. So it's really interesting to see, will the monarchies weather this, whether by paying off the population like Abdullah did in, in Saudi, or because there perhaps is more legitimacy, like maybe the case in Jordan with King Abdullah there, or uh, in, in Morocco. It's not clear. But I think your point that it's going to look, I think we're all looking from the outside, like, okay, what are they going to decide on? What's this Islamic democracy going to look like? What's, you know, paint a picture of it. And I think it's going to look, I think you're right. Your suspicion is right. I think it's going to look very, very different in, in different places because the histories are so different. And how they're going to achieve it is turning out to be so very different. Let That's me, a great point. Can I, oh, may I, let me just follow up on, on your point about the, the differences that we might see. Because I think the differences that we might see, again, are rooted in a failure of historical analysis. If we're looking at, at uh, particularly uh, monarchical houses across this space, 
then we fail to realize that some of the states that we hold up as democratic models in the West are in fact parliamentary monarchies. So, so what, is, what is to keep us from understanding that, that um, and I, I would take, take some exception to Mark's uh, term in describing the, the, uh, the Saudi um, regime as impervious, all right? The ways in which the Saudis have, uh, have reacted to, to a number of different issues uh, in the region, um, not simply beginning with the events of this year, but beginning with, um, with Iran, uh, pose notions about how the Saudis believe that they need to maneuver both externally and internally. And so, so those kinds of pressures are, um, are the kinds of pressures that, that become part of what I was thinking of when I talked about the notion of the process as opposed to the event. So the, the, the only answer we can give is that we really don't know. But the possibilities and potentials are there given the kinds of historical analysis that we're capable of performing in terms of thinking about the various kinds of scenarios that might unfold here. I think we have time for one more question. I think this gentleman. Could you, could you speak a little bit about Sharia law? Uh, one, uh, how homogenous it is, and then secondly, whether or not uh, some of the divisions or sects within Islam, whether or not some of the uh, extreme examples and moderate examples that I've read and heard about apply to individu those individual sex? Yeah, because first, yeah. okay, cool. Um, <laughs> that's a good question, and I find it a really interesting subject myself. Um, in the Arab world, the, the use of Sharia-based law in the legal systems has been limited primarily to the realm of family law. And the modern states have constructed personal status codes to deal with marriage and divorce and questions like that, drawing on Sharia sources but doing so in a way that it's not fully eclectic, but they're not, there's not some sort of, sort of perfect Sharia out there that gets put into a code and, and poof, you have Sharia. So in all of the Arab countries, they may follow one particular jurisprudential tradition, but they also draw on the other traditions and they reform over time. So what's on the table possibly as what's going to be regarded as Sharia for legal purposes is itself subject to some construction. That makes it a political question, at least to some degree, even when it's not posed as a political question. Um, in terms of the variations, we see actually uh, a fair amount of consistency across the region about the way that Sharia is used in family law. And I would, again, maybe leave out Saudi Arabia um, and a couple of the Gulf countries here just in, in sort of functional terms. But that's been the pattern, and I think that pattern will continue in terms of the way Sharia is corporate, incorporated into legal systems. It's not used for criminal law in very many places at all, and the sectarian differences haven't been striking. One of the things that's still on the table in Iraq is whether there will be two separate uh, Muslim family laws for um, Sunnis and Shias, but that's, uh, that's a political question that just hasn't been settled yet. Did you want to add? Yeah. The, the last point that, that Catherine makes, though, um, emphasizes the, the, the notion of variation in Sharia law. Um, most people who study this historically uh, understand that, that there are, in fact, schools of jurisprudence that speak to differentiation in interpretation and philosophy of the practice of law itself. Um, that in many spaces, and again, one needs to, think, needs to understand that Sharia is practice not just simply in the Middle East, but in lots of Arabs, lots of Muslim states that are not Arab and not Middle Eastern. So therefore, the question of Sharia is subject to cultural interpretation at all. So when we talk about it and think of it as, as monolithic, we miss the fine critical and analytical points of how it might be understood and how some people are arguing for the liberalization of the processes in different and sundry ways. Very good. Well, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Mark and Catherine and Magan, and also uh, each of you for, uh, for coming to this uh, event. I thought it was uh, an excellent, so we'd like to give a round of applause. For